I've been trying to come up with a message for a few weeks on children because I knew that uh, Pastor Jim and Ruth would be having the VBS this week and also there'd be some of the kids that'd be coming back today and so on and so forth. And so my message is simply on the screen, sacrificing children to the gods of this world. Would you bow your hearts with me in prayer? Father God, the next few moments, I'm going to be speaking from your word about how some parents have actually sacrificed their children to the gods of the world. And I pray, Lord Jesus, that as I speak, your voice, not my voice, but your voice would be heard through the power of your word. And people would go home today knowing not only that this church is a loving, caring, sharing church, that this pastor is a loving, caring, sharing pastor, that the people attend here are loving, sharing, caring people, but that you are truly a loving, caring, sharing God. I pray this in Jesus' name. And everyone who agrees that God is a loving, caring, sharing God, say amen. amen. Well, for me to be totally transparent this morning, I do acknowledge something to you. And that something is on Sunday, July 12th, 1998, or 19 years ago this month, I stood behind this very same pulpit and I preached a message with the exact same title that I'm using today. I also need to acknowledge that the fact that the scriptural foundation that I'm using today is the same one I used on July 12th, 1998. The only difference is, on that day I read from the New International Version, and today I'm reading from the Message Bible. So let me begin by reading from the Message Bible, Deuteronomy chapter 12, verses 28 through 32. We find these words. Be vigilant. Listen obediently to these words that I command you so that you'll have a good life, you and your children, for a long, long time doing what is good and right in the eyes of God, your God. When God, your God, cuts off the nations whose lands you are invading, shoves them out of your way so that you can displace them and settle in their land, be careful that you don't get curious about them after they've been destroyed before you. Hmm, let me continue here. Don't get fascinated with their gods. And notice it's little g. Thinking, I wonder what it was like for them worshiping their gods, little g. I'd like to try that myself. Don't do this to God, big G. Don't do this to God, your God. They commit every imaginable abomination with their gods, little g. Big G, God, hates it all with a passion. Why, they even set their children on fire as offerings or sacrifices to their gods. Diligently do everything I command you the way I command you. Don't add to it. Don't subtract from it. Beloved, I've already told you that the title of today's message as well as today's scripture foundation is the exact same one I used on July 12, 1998. And being that is so, I guess I need to tell you this as well. The message I'm going to preach this morning, and I keep a written transcript of every message I've been preaching since I've been a lead pastor since 1979. The message I'm preaching today, the words I'm going to use are only going to be slightly different than the words I used 19 years ago this month. And to be perfectly candid, because of that, during my prayer time, I actually debated with God in my prayer time, saying, Lord, why would you want me to preach a message that I preached 19 years ago? I actually said this to the Lord. I know none of you have ever argued with God because you're much more spiritual than I am. I said, God, aren't things a whole lot different today than they were in the year 1998? And yes, to be frank, in some ways things are different, a whole lot different than they were back then. However, I found many things to be the exact same. In fact, after continuing to argue with God for divine direction, 
section. Please give me something else to preach on. Some children's ministry message about suffer little children to come home to me for such is the kingdom of God or something like that. The Holy Spirit pointed me out the following. Times may change, but without God's help, people won't. And God never changes. And if truth be told, many people, including many Christian people and parents, are still, in the year 2017, still sacrificing their children, not to God. And by the way, in the Bible times, and in the Bible translations, when it talks about sacrifice, it's actually making an offering, if you will. They're not still just offering their children to the gods of the world. They think that God's Word is not up to date. Who do they think wrote this book? God's up to date. And as far as God changing his mind or his opinion, I think Jesus, who is not only the Son of God, he is God, he said it best when he said this in Luke 16 and 18. The sky will disintegrate and the earth will dissolve before a single letter of God's law wears out. If you believe that, say amen. Friends, since God's voice could still be heard through the power of his word, and since my scripture foundation today, Deuteronomy chapter 12, is just as much a part of God's word as any other part of the Bible. It's my belief, and I think I could prove it from scripture, that Father God is just as concerned about your children, my children, our children, the children who live today, just as concerned as he was for the children who lived in the day that Moses warned under God's divine inspiration, he warned people not to sacrifice their children to the little G, to the gods of this world. Now to be honest, I've been in ministry with my wife since 1971 when we got married. I was a children's pastor. God helped those children. I was a youth pastor. God helped those youth. And I was actually even a worship leader and associate pastor. But since 1979, I've been a lead pastor. And being a lead pastor, I have had more than one opportunity, more opportunities than I care to admit, to speak to parents from all different walks of life who have had their hearts broken because their children's lives have been ruined by sorts of addictions, addictions to drugs, or addictions to alcohol, or addictions to pornography, addictions to sex, or by some other form of addiction that society has decided to label as a form of social maladjustment. Some psychiatrists, psychologists have even called these addictions, these diseases, these sicknesses as, well, their problems will go away with proper counseling. And even though I do somewhat agree that some of these addictions are a disease or they are a sickness, I have learned by looking into God's Word, there's no place I could find alcohol as an addiction. There's no place I could find pornography as an addiction. There's nowhere I could find promiscuity as an addiction. There's nowhere I could find drugs called an addiction. These diseases, these addictions, these addictions, sicknesses, I prefer to call them what God calls them, sin. Or let me put it more modern. I believe they're sin sicknesses. And the reason I prefer to call these addictions, these diseases, these sicknesses, sin sicknesses is because as a pastor, I have been an eyewitness. I mean, since 1971, since the lead pastor of 1979, I have been an eyewitness to more than one child who has grown up in the church, dedicated them as babies, water baptized them, performed their marriages, dedicated their children. I've been an eyewitness to more than one of these people leave the church and lose not only their own soul, but lose the eternal soul of their children and grandchildren Because the biggest carrier of sin sickness, the one who is the God of this world, Satan himself, has encouraged parents and grandparents 
to have their children act like and talk like and walk like and look like the world instead of acting like, talking like, and looking like Jesus would have them do. I want you to listen to me for a moment. Look around for a second. You see any kids here? You see any youth here? The reason this and other churches are having difficulty keeping young people, keeping young adults in the pew, is not because this or other churches do not provide enough social activities for them. Believe me, we're not a huge church, but we provided a million dollar building that's paid for that has a gym and has a weight room. It has video games. We have a million dollar building that provides great children's programs. We spent this week well over a thousand dollars not counting Jim and Ruth's salary, just in having activities, bouncy houses, other things outside, all kind of games and activities for these kids. And I said it to you last week, how many believe you can't put a price on even one child's soul? But the reason churches are losing young people, losing children, is not because the church doesn't provide enough social activity for them or because the church's music is not contemporary enough or because the pastor's sermons are boring. Believe me, those are not the reasons why churches, not just this church, but churches all over the place, are losing children and young people. The main reason churches are having difficulty keeping children, keeping young people, keeping young adults of abuse is because the main carrier of the sin sickness, Satan himself, has tempted and encouraged parents to sacrifice their children to the gods of this world. After all, what parent doesn't want their children to be successful in the marketplace? And unfortunately, many a parent has succumbed to the devil's temptation, his encouragement, if you will, and they've unwittingly sacrificed their children, their children's eternal souls to the gods of this world. Oh, you say, well, pastor, my kids don't have to come to church to be a believer. Really? Name me three practicing Christians. I'm not talking to Christians who practice like the world practices, that acts like, talks like, lives like the world. I'm talking to you like one that acts like, talks like, and lives like Jesus. Name one that you know that stays away from church when they have the opportunity to go. It's because the devil has tempted and encouraged parents and grandparents, and they've unwittingly sacrificed their children's eternal souls and their grandchildren's eternal souls the gods of the world. Now, some of you right now, you're looking at me with that, boy, pastor, you sound more like a crusader than you do a pastor. And you know what? If that's the way I sound today, so be it. For I am on a mission today, a mission that encourages me, and I hope it encourages you, to never give up on one single child, to never give up on one single youth, to never give up on one single young adult, or never give up on one single family. And I know I can't speak for you, but I hope I am when I say I've become sick and tired of watching child after child after child, young person after young person after young person, young family after young family after young family, not only leave the church, but put their relationship with Father God on hold as they've sacrificed their children, their grandchildren, and themselves to the gods of this world. In fact, I've become so sick of it. I've told God I'm willing to do spiritual warfare if need be to bring children and young families back into God's house. If you believe that's a mission worth having, give the Lord a hand clap. Now if you're willing to join me in that effort, say amen. Amen. Listen to what God's Word says. St. Paul in his letter to the church in Ephesus describes what we're going to be up against in this spiritual warfare. It's not going to be easy. Right under divine inspiration, Paul pens these words. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and against powers and against the rulers of darkness of this age and against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. You'll find that in Ephesians 6 and 12, New King James Version. Later, Paul, writing again under divine inspiration, pens these words to the Corinthian church. 
For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but they're mighty in God for the purpose of pulling down the enemy's strongholds. Wow. Ed Hartman didn't say this. According to God's voice through the power of His Word, the weapons that God gave us are not man-made. They were made by Him, meaning they are more than capable of pulling down, destroying, annihilating any weapon that Satan would attempt to use against you, against me, against our children, against our grandchildren, against young families. We have a responsibility to do the battle and use the weapons that God has given us to win the war. If you believe with that, say amen. Moving forward in today's message entitled Sacrificing Children to the Gods of This World. I want to take just a moment to share with you just one of the things that the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart in my innermost being of how parents, and I mean this in love, folks. Some of you have done this, and I'm not mad at you. I love you. How you've unwittingly sacrificed your children and maybe now even your grandchildren to the gods of this world. As the Holy Spirit spoke into my heart, He reminded me that most Christian parents, how many are a Christian? How many are a Christian parent? Okay. You're a believer. You truly want both yourself and your children to do what's right. Therefore, you're willing to follow what this book teaches. And so therefore, I would tell you that you need to accept the challenge that St. Paul gave to the church at Rome. In Romans 12 and 1, New King James, here's what he begs you. He says, I beseech you, I beg you, I plead with you by the mercy of God that you present yourself a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your unreasonable service. Which is your what? It's reasonable. If you expect your children to stay in church, if you expect your grandchildren to stay in church, if you expect your great-grandchildren you may never see to be brought up in church, Paul is saying, I beg with you, I plead with you, you begin by presenting your body a living sacrifice. It's holy, it's acceptable, and it's reasonable to give you this challenge. Friends, being wholly acceptable to God is something that every parent needs to do for themselves and they need to challenge every one of their children and their grandchildren, whether their children are already grown or not, to accept the challenge to do that. The problem comes not from encouraging our children to live their lives for Jesus. The problem is the children get a little bit older into their teen years, if you say. And we want, well, I put it on the screen, many parents want their children to be acceptable to both God and to the marketplace, even if it means sacrificing or offering their children to the gods of this world. Guess what? That's not realistic. In fact, it's impossible to do both. Jesus put the impossibility this way in Matthew 6 and 24. I'm reading this from the New Living Translation. No one, everybody say no one, No one can serve two masters. That's what Jesus is saying. For you will hate the one and love the other. Hmm. You will be devoted to the one and you'll despise the other. You cannot serve both God and a paycheck. You hear me, folks? That doesn't mean that we're not supposed to earn our money. It doesn't mean that God doesn't want us to work for a living. The Bible actually says, if they don't work, don't let them eat. But you have to determine when you go to work. Your kids have to go determine when they go to work that their real responsibility, their real occupation is living for Jesus. In school, at work, at play, everywhere they go, there's nowhere they get to take off the Christian garb and say, "Woo! I'm going to look like the world, I'm going to act like the world, I'm going to talk like the world because I want to be accepted by the world and I want to be promoted on my job. By the way, it's not just me saying this. If I'm the only one that said that, you could take it as an opinion. You could say, well, that's just pastor's opinion. But being Jesus said no one could serve two masters. 
Me and Jesus said you'll end up hating the one and loving the other. Me and Jesus said you'll be devoted to the one and despising the other. Me and Jesus said you can't serve God and your paycheck. You need to accept that as a statement of fact, not a statement that's just somebody's opinion. How many believe Jesus is God? How many believe Jesus tells the truth? Accept his teaching as a statement of fact. Let me give you the Hartman's paraphrase. I've said this before. I, I like sometimes just to write out, I handwrite occasionally. I'll find a verse of scripture and I write out what I think that means. Now, now I went to seminary. I, I know a little bit of Greek and Hebrew, but I'm far from a scholar in either one of those. But I like to write out and then check it and see if I'm out of context. I don't think I'm taking Matthew 6 and 24 out of context. Hartman's paraphrase of vision, this is what I wrote down. No one, including your children, could serve both God and the gods of the world at the same time. Can't be done. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but in the year 2017, so many believers have begun to act like and talk like and look like the world that no one except God himself could tell the difference. In fact, uh, who's the pastor in Ormond Beach? Rayleigh, what's his first name? Jim Rayleigh, great pastor, pastors two, 3,000 people. Barbara and I saw on the line the other day where he put on his Facebook or somewhere else, he said, you know what? He said, the church is supposed to be good at evangelism. Unfortunately, the world seems better at evangelism than the church. And he has a church of a couple thousand. He said, look around the pew. How many people do you know don't ever go to church anymore? It seems the world is better at evangelism than the, their church is. And being that which I said is true, maybe just maybe it's time that we as individuals, we as a church, and all believers everywhere stop acting, talking, and looking like the world and start acting like and talking like and looking like well, I like what one scripture says. He calls us ambassadors for Christ. Start acting like, talking like, and looking like you're an ambassador, a representative of Jesus Christ. And maybe, just maybe, it's time for Christian parents to teach their children and their grandchildren that acting like, talking like, and looking like the world is going to hinder and possibly destroy their relationship with Father God. All of that to say this, it's on the screen. Please tell your children that they need to be different from the world. Let me repeat that. Please tell your children that they need to be different from the world. God's voice speaking to us through the power of his world asks a question in Mark chapter 8. He says, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? Hmm. And I don't think I'm taking this verse out of context. Again, Hartman's paraphrase edition puts it this way. What will it profit a mother and father if their children gain the whole world and lose their own soul? Now, I'm going to say this in love. I love to brag about my kids. I love to brag about my grandchildren. And I love hearing other people bragging about their children and their grandchildren. But less and less... And I mean less and less, I'm hearing parents and grandchildren telling me, Pastor, guess what? My child's living for Jesus. Guess what? My kid's in Bible school. Guess what? My kid's going to the mission field. No, I'm hearing, my kid just got a promotion. He's making 100 grand a year or 50 grand a year or whatever. My kid's really doing well. On the, my kid just graduated from college with honors. My kid's doing this. My kid, And none of those things are bad as long as the kid knows they can't serve Jesus and serve the world at the exact same time, Jesus said it's impossible. And by the way, Scripture says it's impossible to please God unless you believe that He's the rewarder of those who diligently seek Him, of those who intentionally do things the way he would have them done. Again, I can't speak for you, but as one who's been both a parent and a pastor, and now a grandparent with eight grandchildren, it makes no sense to me whatsoever why any parent would allow and even encourage their young children to make decisions that that child is not mature enough to make for their own. Let me give you an example. Now, I know none of you would do this, but if you've done it, shame on you. What parent in their right mind 
would allow their child to stay home from school for an extended period of time simply because the child says, well, you know, I don't like my teacher. I don't like math. Can I just go at 10 o'clock in the morning? I have math at 9. I just don't like math. Or could you get me to come home at noon because I'm having English and I don't like to take English? What parent in their right mind I mean, I know that sometimes we as parents let a kid skip a day. I, I mean, I was one, and I'll admit this, this is one of my sins as a child. When I was in elementary school, I had a fourth grade teacher named Mrs. Devereaux. God love her. I hope she's in heaven. But I didn't just dislike this kid, this teacher. I really disliked her. In fact, I disliked her so much there were times when my mom would fix breakfast and when she'd go in the other room, I would mix the little eggs up on the plate and the cereal she gave me, and throw it on the floor and go, ah, ah, ah. my bubble would come in. I said, I'm sick, I'm throwing up. My dad saw me doing that one day and made me eat it off the floor. I kid you not. Didn't do that again. Again, what parent in their right mind would let their child stay home from school for an extended period of time simply because the kid didn't want to go? A good parent would insist the child go to school because the good parent knows that school, the child might not know it, but the good parent knows that school is going to be beneficial to that child later in life. Speaking about things that are beneficial to children later in life, why would a godly parent allow their child to stay home from Sunday school? or stay home from church simply because the child doesn't want to go. But yet parents do this all the time, even though they know that Sunday school and church is going to be beneficial to that child later in life. Here's my point. Allowing children, and I weep over this, children who parents have publicly dedicated to the Lord... Parents who stand up here and say, I promise to make my home a sanctuary for my kids where they'll learn about Jesus. I promise that I'm going to bring my kids to church. And if I move away, I'm going to find a church and take my kid there where they can learn about Jesus. They allow their kids to make bad decisions and stay home from Sunday school and church. For some reason, they don't recognize that staying home from Sunday school and church is not going to be beneficial to their life. And I know with little children, Jim and Ruth would tell you, Pastor Jim and Ruth would tell you this, you get kids when they're in that age, the real small ones. I was one who got saved every Sunday. Now, I really didn't. Now, when the children's director would say it happened to be a mother, anybody need to give your heart to Jesus? I mean, every Sunday for the first eight or ten years of my life, I would be the one raising my hand. Why? Because little kids realize, they don't understand yet that once you're saved, not that you can't go back, but when you're making an effort to do what's right, God will help you. And it's the Holy Spirit that's pointing out to that child, you shouldn't do that. You used to do that before you accepted Christ. But now they've accepted Christ, the Holy Spirit said, stop doing that. That's not the right thing to do. And so at 10, I finally realized, hey, I'm redeemed by love divine. Not that I'm perfect, but he's perfect. Glory, glory, Christ is mine. All to him I now resign. For I have been, I have been redeemed. Friend, there's not a single scripture anywhere in the Bible that informs any parent, especially Christian parents, that just because their child accepted Jesus in Sunday school or in children's church, that their child will never make a bad decision. All that to say this, don't think your child has wisdom beyond their years just because Pastor Jim said they raised their hand in church and got saved. I loved it. Is my daughter Michelle here today? I loved her when she came and I was past a little church of 25, 30 people and she came, I think she was probably kindergarten age, first grade, came and pulled on my pant leg in the lobby of the church, which wasn't as big as this lobby, obviously, and said, Daddy, Daddy, Miss Forrest told me to tell you I accepted Jesus in my heart. You remember that? You remember, Michelle, you remember that a little bit? Yeah. I loved it that my oldest boy found Jesus at three years old at a kid's crusade. And I can't remember who, who was it? Uncle, Jim, Uncle who? Uncle David and Aunt Donna. 
I accepted Jesus, Uncle David and Aunt Donna, who were dressed up as David Crockett and Annie Oakley. My kids got one to the Lord by David Crockett and Annie Oakley. I love that. I love that all my children could tell me the circumstances surrounding the day they gave their heart to Jesus. But I, as a parent, had a responsibility to keep them in Sunday school and keep them in church. Why? Train up a child in the way they shall go, and when they grow old, they will not depart from it. And listen to me, folks. Letting your kids stay home from Sunday school and church is not training them up in the way they should go. And then when you're an adult, well, I train them up. Really? Parents, Christian parents, need to give guidance to their children. And I'm going to say something that some people may not agree with. You need to give direction and guidance to your children when they're young, even if that direction, that guidance, includes disciplining them. Now, I'm not suggesting that any parent physically or emotionally abuse their child. However, not at Hartman, but God's Word informs us as parents that a parent who doesn't love his child, that parent will not discipline that child. And believe me, as a pastor, as a lead pastor since 1979, as one who has dedicated children, water-baptized children, married young adults, dedicated their children, baptized their children, so on and so forth, I've seen the unfortunate long-term results that could take place in the lives of children whose parents don't believe in disciplining their kids. Again, I'm not telling you you need to abuse your kids. And as the kids get older, there needs to be different forms of discipline. I had one. This is no exaggeration. I'm not going to name which one. It wasn't my daughter. She's my favorite. The son say that. But I had one come to me one time and says, I can't wait till I'm 18 so I can get out of this house. Now, guess what this father did? I looked him in the eye and I said, you think you're the only one that can't wait? And I remember he, he didn't turn 18 until the spring of the year of his senior year in high school. He went to his mother the day before and he said, and I had told him this a couple years before when he was about 16, Mommy, is Daddy going to throw me out when I turn 18 tomorrow? <laughs> she says, I don't know. You better toe the line. And that kid was so good. He played drums in church. He went to church. He did what he was supposed to do. Did he always make good decisions? No. In fact, now that he's 45, is he 45? He still makes decisions where I'm going, is that the way your father raised you? In fact, he has said to me more than one time, Daddy, I am so thankful you spanked me. If you hadn't spanked me, I'd be in jail today. I'm going, oh, good Lord, please don't tell me what you've been doing. Now, I may be repeating myself, but it's, I believe it's necessary. It has never been God's plan for parents to allow children to make decisions that their children are not mature enough to make. If you agree with that, say amen. If you'll take the time to make a biblical study on parent-child relationships, you'll discover there's a biblical way, God's way, if you will, to guide, to direct your children in a way that will benefit their eternal soul. And remember, it was Jesus who asked the question, what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul. In other words, Jesus is saying that's possible. Is that what it says? But, but, well, no, that's, that's, not, that's not true. I mean, once a kid's saved, you know, what, what, what does it profit a man if he gains the whole world? And how could you lose it if you didn't have it? What does it profit a man if he gains the whole world and loses his own soul? And again, I don't think I'm taking it out of context. Hartman paraphrase. What does it profit a mother and father if their children would gain the whole world and lose their own souls. I think they're agreeing with me. Say amen. Well, it's time, little darling. For those of you that are visiting, Barbara's my little darling. She's my wife, and she's coming to the piano and beginning to play as Jonathan, our worship leader, comes. and Is he hiding out somewhere? I never could see back. You all need to sit here one time under these lights. You know, you could all be doing that. I'm going to do some things you should not do. You could all do this. I would never see it. You could all get up and walk out. I'd see a shadow, but that'd be about it. <laughs> Is John out here somewhere? Is he already coming to the platform? He's already up here? 
Thank you, Jonathan. So as Barbara begins to play and Jonathan prepares to lead us in a closing song, hymn, they, they get to choose. Over the years, well, I hate to admit it, but uh, don't you tell Pastor Jim and Ruth this. I'm getting a little too old to be a children's pastor. <laughs> I was tired every night. In fact, Sunday night, Monday night, and Tuesday night, I said to Pastor Jim, I said, Pastor Jim, I I've been here all day at church. Is it okay if I slip out at 730? <laughs> Now, Wednesday, I stayed for the whole thing, and it was great. But I, I tried to go around and see everything. But over the years, I've had more than one parent tell me that when it came to raising their children, they chose to follow other manuals and books instead of the instruction that's given in God's Word. And when I ask them why, they say something like this. Well, Pastor, let's be honest. This was written thousands of years ago. It's not up to date. Modern methods are, are, are more suited for modern times. Wow. I mean, wow. How do you respond to that? I usually just pick up a Bible in my office, look them straight in the face and say, who do you think wrote this book? He's never out of date. If you agree with that, say amen. We need to remember that Jesus said, the sky will disintegrate and the earth will dissolve before a single letter of God's law will wear out. And if you happen to be old school, maybe you prefer the King James Version, it splits it this way. It is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle, one little bit of the law of God to fail. Final closing, final challenge, it's on the screen. Pray with me that parents will stop sacrificing their children to the gods of this world. Would you bow your heart with me in prayer for just a moment? Father, that's our challenge today. That's our prayer today. That parents will stop. I know they do it unwillingly. They want, they want their child to be successful in both their relationship with you and their relationship with those in the world. You said it's impossible. And so I pray today that parents will stop sacrificing, stop offering their children to the gods of this world. I pray, Lord, that any child who's grown and left the church, any young person who's grown and left the church, any adult that's grown up and left the church, I pray that you would bring them back. I promise you, Lord, I'm willing to do spiritual warfare, whatever's necessary to bring them back. I need divine direction from you on how to do that. And we as a church, we pray for divine direction. We're doing everything we know to do. And we're asking you to help us do things that we do not know to do. Do things that are pleasing in your sight. That no children who come to this church, no child, no young person, no young family will be sacrificed to the gods of this world. If you agree with that prayer, say amen. Jonathan, what are we going to sing in worship today? You got a song? Could we stand together and sing a closing song?